The NFL has always been filled with memorable personalities. For some reason, a good chunk of those characters played the wide receiver position in the 2000s and 2010s. We all know the Ocho Cinco's, the T.O.'s, and the Randy Mosses of the world. But another such eccentric and talented receiver flew under the radar during his playing days, and even more so since his retirement. Stevie Johnson, formerly of the Buffalo Bills. For a short period there, barely a decade ago, Stevie was one of the league's most consistent receivers, despite dealing with subpar QB play at best. And of course, there were all of his antics after the play, both good and bad, that were sure to be headliners. Yet some people, <laughs> my podcast co-host Joe from Fanatic Sports, claim to have never even heard of the man. And I'm sure he's not the only one out there because of how kids these days are. So I figured it was time for a look back and a deep dive into the career of the one and only Stevie Johnson. Johnson had humble beginnings. He was homeschooled for much of his life, and he only played high school football for two seasons because his school, Angelo Rodriguez High, didn't add a football program until his junior year. He scored the first touchdown in Mustangs history and three overall as a running back in the team's 2002 opener, a 40-0 victory. He switched to quarterback in his senior season, earning All-State and first-team All-Conference honors. He never even played receiver until a Nike camp prior to his enrollment at Chabot College, and he instantly caught on. Johnson had 607 yards and 6 TDs as a freshman and made All-Region 2 All-California first team as a sophomore. He transferred to Kentucky where he made first team All-SEC as a senior thanks to a 1,000-yard 13-score season in which he caught three game winners, two of which were against number 9 Louisville and number 1 LSU. Due to his limited experience, however, he wasn't selected until the middle of the 7th round of the 2008 NFL Draft by the Bills. He only caught 10 passes as a rookie, though two of those receptions went for touchdowns late in the season. He only played in five games the following year thanks to a lingering rib injury. However, in 2010, Johnson came back with a vengeance. He credited veteran corner Drayton Florence for helping him become a better all-around wideout by giving him special DB insights. Johnson liked to call himself a space creator. He defined that mentality as understanding DB types and using irregular movements within routes to create more space from the DB and help QB windows. This ability to get open by any means necessary helped Johnson nail down a starting job and run with it in 2010. The magic began in week 3 when Ryan Fitzpatrick took over as Buffalo's starting quarterback, pun intended. The two instantly developed a great chemistry. The Bills' comeback against the vaunted Patriots fell short, but Johnson proved his worth when he blew by Devin McCourty on a stop-and-go route for a score in the fourth. After the score, he decided to celebrate by mimicking the Patriots' Minutemen firing a rifle. He fell to the ground pretending to be shot, for which he was both penalized and fined. Nevertheless, this breakout game propelled Stevie into the national spotlight. It was the beginning of a five-game streak with at least one touchdown reception, a feat that only Dwayne Bowe bested during the 2010 season. He made Kyle Wilson bite on the slightest of double moves in Week 4. And then he had his first multi-score game the following week against Jacksonville, his first being on a fade versus Rasheen Mathis, despite the corner having him in an armbar, and on the second, Johnson left Mathis tasting some nice Buffalo turf. And Johnson was just getting started embarrassing defensive backs. The following week against a Ravens team that had the fifth best defense in the league per DVOA, Stevie had a career best day. He had the first 100-yard game of his career, and his 158 yards still stands as his best ever. He roasted Fabian Washington on numerous occasions with shake-and-bake moves at the snap, and he forced missed tackles by others to pile up a ton of valuable yak. Johnson also hit Lardarius Webb with a sharp fake inside to get open deep for an easy 33-yard touchdown in the first half. The then 0-5 Bills eventually lost to the playoff-bound Ravens, but Johnson helped give them a chance by making a tough grab to set up the game-tying field goal to go to OT. From there, Johnson continued to soar. He scored a game-tying touchdown the next week in another heartbreaking road overtime loss against a playoff team. Then against the Bears, he had the second highest yardage output of his career with 145. Once again, this was another elite performance in a close loss versus a great opponent, as Chicago had the third best defense in football. Stevie truly introduced himself to the world with his performance in Cincinnati, however. The Bills trailed the Bengals 28-7 late in the first half and 31-14 at halftime. With just under 11 minutes left in the third, Stevie caught a pass downfield and juked Chinadum and Dukeway out of his cleats for a 28-yard score to cut it to a 10-point deficit. 
Afterwards, he lifted his jersey to reveal the phrase, Why So Serious, written on his shirt, a nod to the Joker from The Dark Knight, playing off the fact that Bengals receivers Terrell Owens and Chad Ochocinco referred to themselves as Batman and Robin. Johnson was fined $5,000 for the gesture, but I'd say it was worth it. A minute later, Johnson's good friend Drayton Florence recovered a fumble for a score to cut it to three. In the fourth quarter, Johnson beat Leon Hall in the back corner of the end zone to take the lead for Buffalo. Three minutes later, he decided to pile on with a 32-yard receiving touchdown, his third score of the day, becoming just the 10th player to have such a game that season. He finished the game with more receptions, yards, and TDs than Batman and Robin had combined. But after the high came the low. Against the number one ranked Steelers defense, Johnson got open plenty, as Ike Taylor can attest. But he dropped a whopping five passes, one of which popped into the arms of Troy Polamalu for a pick. But the Bills remained true and forced overtime against the eventual AFC champs. However, that's where a disaster struck. Johnson got open downfield by smoking Taylor on a double move, but with plenty of separation, he blatantly dropped what would have been a game-winning 40-yard touchdown on a perfect Fitzpatrick pass. He silently sat in the end zone dejectedly for a moment after the play. The Bills wound up punting on the drive and they had to watch the Steelers drive down the field for the subsequent game-winning field goal. Following the game, Johnson took to Twitter to seemingly blame God for the play. The tweet was made fun of on every national outlet and Johnson received death threats. He later clarified that he was just asking why and players like Kurt Warner had his back. Johnson's explanation harkened back to a famous George Carlin bit. And what can we do to silence these Christian athletes who thank Jesus whenever they win, never mention his name when they lose? Not a word. You never hear him say, Jesus made me drop the ball. Tim Graham of The Athletic wrote an excellent piece on the incident 10 years after the fact that I will link below. You couldn't help but feel bad for him in the moment, but it helped push him forward and continue thriving. He kept embarrassing defensive backs for the remainder of the season, finishing with 82 receptions, 11th in the NFL, 1,073 yards, also 11th in the NFL, and 10 receiving touchdowns tied for 7th in the league. His 10 scores that year is still just one shy of the Bills' single season record. One might expect a third-year player who just eclipsed 102 yards in a season for the first time to regress a bit, but Stevie Johnson is different. He opened the 2011 campaign with a touchdown in three straight games, a feat which only five players matched in weeks one to three that year. He outlapped Brandon Flowers for a monstrous TD grab and a blowout win over the Chiefs. Then he shook Jerome Boyd with a fake speed route as he helped Buffalo overcome an 18-point deficit versus the Raiders in week two. And the next week, the Bills one-upped themselves, overcoming a 21-point deficit to stun the eventual AFC champion Patriots to start the season 3-0. In the process, Johnson helped Devin McCourty realize that his rightful position was safety and not corner. Johnson also embarrassed Corey Webster for a game-tying touchdown in the fourth quarter against the eventual Super Bowl champion Giants in Week 6. Perhaps Johnson's true claim to fame, however, came from the fact that he routinely terrorized another corner, one not so used to being terrorized. Revis Island, the locale where countless elite wide receivers went lost for ages, also happened to be Stevie Johnson's favorite vacation home. Darrell Revis was the most dominant corner of his era, putting up a PFF grade of 90 plus in three of four seasons, including in 2011. But Stevie always seemed to have his number with his unconventional route running style. Even the most shut down DBs will have trouble guarding a guy who just goes with the flow to find open areas, looking more like a basketball player on the football field. Per PFF starting, Revis allowed the most yards in his coverage of the 2011 season against Buffalo in Week 9, and the second most in Week 12 versus Buffalo, most of which came courtesy of Stevie. Johnson beat Revis off the snap deep in the first matchup with a quick burst outside, some shoulder shakes, and some hand fighting for a 52-yard gain. He also showed off his exquisite footwork on the sidelines in more tight coverage later on. In the second matchup, Johnson was relentless on the slant routes, consistently gaining separation. Even if it was only 5 yards here, 7 yards there, you have to consider that nobody else was doing that against Revis. The unpredictability of Stevie's route paths was great enough to befuddle any corner. He was Kyrie Irving on the football field. Johnson also scored a touchdown against Revis on such a slant, and with the touchdown, there also must come a celebration. Following the play, Johnson danced and pretended to shoot himself in the leg, mocking the unfortunate incident then-Jets receiver Plexico Burris endured three years earlier. 
He then flew through the air like a jet, only to crash to the ground. And yes, before you ask, Johnson was flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct on the play. The Bills wound up losing eight of their final nine games in 2011 after starting the season 5-2, but Johnson continued to produce. He finished by putting up 116 yards on the Chargers, 82 yards on the Dolphins, and 92 yards on the Broncos before beating Kyle Arrington to the back of the end zone for a spectacular diving catch for a score in Week 17 in Foxborough to give the Bills a 14-0 lead. Once again, however, he had a message underneath his shirt to show the world. It merely read, Happy New Year, but he was still given a 15-yard penalty, which caused head coach Chan Gailey to bench him for the rest of the game. Buffalo went on to lose 49-21, with Fitzpatrick throwing four picks without his top target. Despite being pulled after just 13 snaps in Week 17, though, Johnson was still able to cross the 1,000-yard receiving threshold for the second consecutive year, becoming the first Buffalo Bill ever to do so. Hall of Famer Andre Reid never did so, nor did Eric Moulds or Lee Evans just the former seventh rounder. Even after now two great seasons, Stevie still had those doubting that he was anything more than a fluke, so he just went out and basically repeated his previous efforts in 2012. Darrell Revis only played two games that year, but Stevie made sure to get him at least once in their week one matchup. The fifth year wideout scored a touchdown in each of the Bills' first three games, including this one on which he embarrassed Browns DB Dimitri Patterson with an elegant shake and bake plus head fake. Against the then 4-1 Cardinals, Johnson helped the Bills win on the road with 82 yards on 6 catches, continuously putting Pro Bowler Patrick Peterson and William Gay in the blender. In Indy, Johnson made Colts corner Darius Butler bite hard on a stop and go to get open for a career-long 63-yard reception. And while Revis disappeared from the spotlight in 2012, Stevie did have an opportunity to roast the league's newest best corner, Richard Sherman. Stevie was one of the rare few who was able to beat Sherman's physical press with some hand fighting of his own. He also beat him for a touchdown with a swift jab outside before cutting back inside and loping back to the corner. Also, not quite on Sherman, but Johnson had one of the highlights of his career in this affair by showing he had the hands to match his elite footwork skills with this nasty one-handed snag. Johnson finished the game with season highs of 8 receptions, 115 yards, and the one score. In his final game catching passes from Ryan Fitzpatrick, Johnson went for 111 yards and a home blowout win over the Jets. Overall, Johnson finished the season with 1,046 receiving yards, his third consecutive over that barrier. Since he was the first Bill to reach that mark in back-to-back -back years, it stands to reason he was also the first to do so in three straight years. To this day, he's the only Bill to do so, though Stephon Diggs has the opportunity to match him in 2022. Johnson was also one of just five wide receivers to cross the 1,000-yard threshold in each of 2010, 2011, and 2012, along with Marcus Colston, Calvin Johnson, Brandon Marshall, and Roddy White. He was in the top 12 of each major receiving category for that three-year stretch, which is impressive considering all of the elite receiving talent of that era. Johnson's running mate Ryan Fitzpatrick was let go after the season, and in came rookie EJ Manuel, but Stevie showed early that he was QB-proof. In week one against the Patriots, he beat two defenders to the back of the end zone for a score to give Buffalo a lead in the second half. The Bills ultimately lost, but the next week was a different story. Johnson had season highs of eight catches, 111 yards, and a score against the Panthers, who had the fourth best pass defense in football per DVOA. His touchdown just happened to be a game winner with two seconds remaining. He remained hot the following week against the Jets with 6 receptions for 86 yards. However, the story of Johnson's 2013 season was the toll injuries took on him. He was in and out of the lineup with hamstring, groin, and back injuries. Played 5 games, missed 1. Came back for 4 more, then missed another, before returning for 3 and then sitting out the final 2 following the death of his mother. After being an Ironman playing all 48 games the prior three seasons, Johnson missed at least three games in each of his final seasons in the league. He had a 7 for 72 and one affair at New Orleans, including this beautiful route leading to a score, but he could never get fully back on track due to both the injuries and the rotating QB room with Manuel, Thaddeus Lewis, and Jeff Toole, a passing game that ranked 28th in DVOA. Despite all the missed action, however, Stevie still led all Bills wideouts in receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns for the fourth consecutive season. A day after the Bills traded up to select Clemson standout Sammy Watkins in the 2014 draft, the team said goodbye to their leading receiver by sending Johnson to the 49ers for a conditional fourth round draft pick in 2015. 
Back with his hometown team, Johnson's numbers dropped due to a crowded receiving room which featured Anquan Bolden, Michael Crabtree, Vernon Davis, and Brandon Lloyd, plus another knee injury which cost him three games. But he still flashed nevertheless. He had 103 yards on nine receptions in Arizona in week three, and caught his first TD as a niner the following week, a beautiful toe-tapping grab with a defender draped all over him, which ignited a comeback win versus the Eagles. His route running prowess was still on point per usual, just ask Marcus Cooper of the Chiefs. Johnson had just four receptions for 36 yards over the final seven weeks of the season, however, so he was predictably let go in March. He latched on with the Chargers and once again started hot, even as a fourth option. He caught a touchdown in his first game as a Charger, along with six catches and 82 yards and a comeback win over Detroit. He successfully avoided numerous tacklers on a bubble screen score against Cincinnati the following week. Through four weeks, Stevie's on pace for nearly 900 yards, but once again the injury bug hit, this time the hamstring again, which caused him to miss two games. He slowly rounded back into form after returning, capping it off with seven catches for 92 yards and a phenomenal toe-tapping score in the back of the end zone to seal a win in Jacksonville. However, unbeknownst to everyone at the time, that score would be his final reception as an NFL player. Johnson injured his groin the following week against Denver and missed the last four games of the season. In training camp prior to the 2016 season, Johnson tore his meniscus and was placed on injured reserve. He was released after the season, and just like that, his career was over. It's a phrase that gets used far too loosely these days, but Stevie Johnson truly was one of a kind, both as a player and a person. Following his retirement, Stevie has remained a supporter of the Bills and even helps train some of the younger receivers from time to time. And he also returned to his alma mater, Rodriguez High, as a head coach during the team's pandemic-delayed spring 2021 football season. Additionally, he hosted a podcast entitled Why So Serious with former Bills wideout Donald Jones, covering their former team from 2018 to 2021. He just always finds his way to the spotlight one way or another, whether he's seeking it or not, because he lives life just the way he played football, by doing things his own way. After all, that's how he got first noticed as a preseason standout. So it was fourth preseason game, you know, that's where we, right. that's where it's our, turn, our time to shine. And uh, Lee walked up to me and was like, I'm excited to see you. I'm excited to watch you play. And that right there just gave me so much inspiration and motivation yeah. to to ball out uh, on that preseason game. And uh, my quarterback at the time was Jabron Hamden. Yep. And, um, you know, we was we was in the game and he he, he told me to do a he told me to do a hitch route. And at the time, I'm like, man, if Lee's ready, he's excited to watch me. He don't want to watch me run a hitch route right now. <laughs> so I'm telling him, I'm like, I'm pointing down like, nah, we running the go. Let's run the go. And uh, he's telling me hitch, so then we get off, he's, he hike, hike the ball, and he see I'm not running the hitch, so he throws it up. I go up and make the play, this is preseason, I go up and make the play, and I feel like this is what got me, I guess, loved in, in the city. Um, when I made it, I turned around, went to the fans instantly, let's go, you know what I'm saying, and got him the ball. <laughs> and I feel like that was, you know, that was the first yeah. connection with, uh, with the fans. And he's the same dude who once got in trouble for high-stepping from the 50-yard line as a kid. It makes sense that the motto he lives by is handle business and have fun, for which he has HBHF tattooed on his right arm. That was exemplified in his playing style. He would always get to where he needed to get, but he often took an unconventional path to get there. But it undoubtedly worked. From a Juco athlete to a seventh round pick to now one of the greatest receivers in Buffalo Bills franchise history. Despite his short peak, Johnson had the 8th most catches in team history, ninth most yards, and the 7th most receiving TDs. A true what-if story considering if he could have had more fortunate health or better QBs and front offices supporting him. However, that's not to say he still didn't have a successful special career regardless. There will never be another Stevie Johnson.